So uh, I'm just kind of, we'll just do it like this. Okay, we're back to our hula hoop message. We're talking about a two-dimensional universe. It's like a sheet of paper. They only know width and length. They have no concept of height. We laid down this hula hoop that's about an inch thick in that realm. And they hit that hula hoop. It's, to them, it's like an impenetrable wall. This, this represents the impossible. To go past there, there is nothing they can do. They can't even think of going over the wall. So we talked about all that this morning. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, see? I mean, his thoughts truly are higher than our thoughts and his ways and our ways. So we talked this morning is like pretty much how he worked in the Old Testament is like God is looking at this universe because I'm, I'm using a two-dimensional reference because we from a three-dimensional world, we could just reach down and pick them up and set them over the wall. We can think heights. We can think depth because that's part of the universe we live in, see? Uh, but God looks on wherever he's from. <laughs> he looks on us. And we're as ign uh, ignorant, <laughs> lack of knowledge, <laughs> when it comes to like what his knowledge is, we're, as, we're limited to our three-dimensional world, the same way that they're limited to their two-dimensional world. So it's kind of like how, he, that, how we first described that. He would come, like, like we would come and just lift them over the wall. We're invading their realm from outside of their realm. Is that okay? You know, God's outside. He's, we're kind of reaching in and helping them over the wall. And then we go back. And really, that's kind of how it was in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit would come up upon the prophet. He would come upon the priest or the king. He would come upon a Gideon or a Samson. You know, you do know it wasn't Samson's mighty muscles that enabled him to do that stuff that he did. If he had like a 20-inch neck and 18-inch biceps, they'd know where his power was coming from. I think he was, you know, 90-pound weakling, you know. And they're going, how is this guy able to do this? Because you couldn't tell by looking at him that he, could, he, he shouldn't be able to do that. Well, but that's how God did it. But see, what's happened in this new covenant, God sent, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch now and talk about our three-dimensional realm. Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, the Word, was with God, and he is God, Right? He's always been there. By him were all things made. Without him was not anything made. No, not one single thing. But this God, this third member of the, uh, this, the son, the second member of the Godhead, he in form became a three-dimensional person. And this infinite, all-knowledge, all-knowing, all-powerful God being, <laughs> the Word, He became three-dimensional flesh and dwelt among us. I closed this morning with looking at the mercies of God. For You could look at, well, we don't have to turn to Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now, again, he's talking about these old fallen See, we're still, we're, we're now, when we get born again, we are a unlimited, born of God, child of God person with a spiritual mind, but we're housed in a three-dimensional body that is still subject to all the temptations of the world. I'm telling you right now, and you know what's true with your body. Your body will do anything you let it do. <laughs> it has no conscience at all in itself. My body thinks smoking, drinking, cussing, and doing <laughs> is fine. Ought to do that a lot. Let's do that even, you know, it, it, it's three-dimensional. It's of, it's of this world. Jesus took on a body like ours. That's what's amazing. But see, when he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to get into that a little more in a minute. When he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, here is, how do I say this? Here is an unlimited being in a three-dimensional limited body. But now, suddenly, here comes God the Holy Ghost <laughs> and baptizes His Spirit. Let me say it another way. Moves in the house. <laughs> 
you know, in this covenant, our bodies, it says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God now is no longer restricted to the outside and coming upon somebody occasionally on the inside. No, now he has somebody on the inside where he can dwell permanently. And now it's just, it's not so much, it's not just a matter of God coming and doing something upon you. Now he's doing stuff through you. Can you see we're headed to revival? <laughs> this is the power. This is what's been missing. This, this that lack of understanding is, a, is part of it. That this God who has always wanted to do the supernatural. Oh, and that lesson this morning. Remember Fred? <laughs> the two-dimensional Fred who just kept he, kept, he wanted to go past the impossible so bad, he would just keep smacking into that wall, smacking into that wall. His nose was getting flat, smacking into that wall. And the, when I meditate on that, the absolute impossibility of Fred being able to do anything to help himself get beyond it. And there's that, that prophecy, that grace. It requires you being absolutely still and allowing me to do what I want to do through you. And that's what's required. Let me ask you, looking at Fred, now the first thing to get past is being born again. Isn't that right? Being set free from sin. Is there anything Fred can do to get himself born again? Can he, can he like bathe more often? Uh, <laughs> give more money? Uh, feed more poor? Those are all good things that we like people that bathe and give. <laughs> you know? But none of it. See, it takes, it's not by might, not by power. It's by my spirit. And we start talking this supernatural realm, anything beyond this three-dimensional realm where we live. It's by his spirit or it does not get done. Amen. Now that kind of brings me to where I want to want to close here. Finish up this. See once we are born again now God by his spirit I mean God by his spirit is able to take up residence within us. He's no longer on the outside looking in. And kind of reaching in by, the, by his hand, the Holy Spirit, once in a while. No. Now he's within. He's where we are. Wherever you go, you're a mobile temple. <laughs> that would be a good title. You're a, you're a mobile temple of God. You're, you're like a temple of God with legs. And everywhere you go, I don't mean just your new nature. Thank God for the new nature. We're going to talk about that in a minute. In this lesson, we're talking God, the Holy Ghost, the same one that was brooding over the waters in Genesis chapter one. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, but the Holy Spirit brooding over the face of the waters. The molecule changer. Every time God said something, let there be light. Who did that? Well, it's Jesus. We know God, can, the Father conceives it. Jesus, the Word, speaks it. But the Holy Spirit is the molecule changer. He's the one that was there. Do you understand that same one that knows how to make light lives in you? <laughs> See, when I, when I say that, my brain starts leaking out my left ear, and suddenly all things are possible. Just exactly like God said. I go, well, if that's so, let's get on with it here. See? Well, we're about to. Well, I'm telling you, we're coming into revival. But it's, it's the same Holy Spirit, not diminished either, that lives in us. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Okay, don't let me get, I don't want to get too far ahead. Amen. But His grace, still yet, if anything supernatural is going to be done, it's not by our might, not by our power. It's by His Spirit that it gets done. Isn't that right? Now, I want to give you guys a preview so you can might do a little uh, preparation homework. Years ago, in the face-to-face -face documents, the Lord taught me many of these same truths in a lesson titled, and you can find it there, The Highest Order of Reality. The Highest Order of Reality. I think it's lesson number 13 in the face-to-face -face documents. And how do you get there? You go to GaryCarpenter.org, 
You click on media. That takes you to a page. About middle way on the right hand side, it says face to face. You click on that. Scroll down. We have it there in audio format or uh, print it where you can print it out if you want to or read it. And I believe it's lesson 13. The works, no, the highest order of reality. There's also another one right there called the works of the Father. They, they really kind of go together. I think they're in sequence there. Now, in that document, he taught me in great detail. This is his quote. Unless my spirit moves, no ministry has taken place. Now, he's talking about supernatural ministry. You can, you can feed the poor. You, let's say feed, <laughs> feed the poor. You can feed the hungry. But listen, atheists can feed the hungry. Muslims can feed the hungry, and, and, and we should feed the hungry. I'm not against that. We're not talking about that kind of thing. We're talking about my friend Homer. Homer will hear this. My friend Homer in Immokalee, Florida, who right now can't see. The sugar diabetes took his eyesight. Dave prayed for him, and he got healed for a while, but then eventually it left. Dave prayed again, and it, it, didn't, it didn't restore. Well, it will restore. How many know that? But see, when that happens, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by His Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of us. And I'm telling you right now, I prophesy, Homer is going to see again, and I mean sooner than later. Amen? Now, that's just the truth. But if you want to get a head start on some of these lessons that are coming, you might go ahead and read The Highest Order of Reality and also The Works of the Father. In fact, I just recommend all of those to you because the truth doesn't change. And the more he's kind of coming in a different way, but I'm seeing the same truths coming in this way that I saw 20 years ago in those documents. Okay. There is no moving beyond that impossible wall without the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Fred had to learn in our illustration. Good old Fred that kept bumping into the wall. I liked it. He kept going to seminars and going to conventions and buying the latest books and but, and that's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I teach it though. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But see, eventually, still yet, it's going to be you and God. You against your impossible wall. And it's going to be the moving of His Spirit that gets you beyond it. And that's going to involve you obeying some instruction from Him. He said to me one time, this isn't in my notes, He says, part of your problem, Gary, He was talking to me directly, he says, you keep expecting for my instructions to come in a manner that will cause you to move. He said, no, when it comes to these like supernatural things, his instructions come in such a manner that they release my spirit to move. This would be things like speak. You remember Jesus one time, he, he, he made clay, put it on the man's eyes said, go wash in that pool. Though that's, see, any of us could do that, right? We can, we can make clay. One time he, hit, one time he spit. <laughs> I heard one preacher one time, he says, I don't know about that anointing now. You, you know, they want you to pray for him, all right, but you're walking up to him and you're going, <laughs> you, know, you're, <laughs> you know, you're hacking up a big one here. <laughs> anyway. All right, maybe I'll go too far. But his instructions, you're going to speak to the mountain, see? Say, no, 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 i got to go get a bulldozer. No, speak to it. Speak to it. And we go, what? Well, we're talking third dimensional. We're talking supernatural stuff. We're talking beyond the impossible wall stuff now. But there is no moving beyond that wall without the moving of his spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Now, these thoughts... Thinking this is just even, and this is especially good for the calling in the lost crowd that listens to these messages, because one of the main things we do is make intercession for our lost loved ones and our lost family members. The more I'm seeing this, you know, nearly all of us, and I'm just going to pick a name, please don't, I'm not picking on your relative, nearly all of us have a mean Aunt Nellie <laughs> that maybe has, I mean, Maybe she cusses and drinks and swears and resists the gospel and cussed you out when you tried to tell her about Jesus. And I mean, maybe she looks like the most impossible wall in your family, the most impossible one, see? And, and you've tried everything. You, you've, you've bumped into that wall. <laughs> but I'm seeing more and more. 
if it's really the Holy Spirit, which it is, how important is our prayer? I mean, prayer, I already have prayer in pretty high regard. But man, I am understanding now even more. No wonder in Ephesians 6, when it starts talking about put on the whole armor of God, and, and then it says praying with all prayer. Pray without ceasing. Pray with all prayer. You talk about that's our offensive warfare. And we'll call Aunt Nellie saved. Say, all right, God, I bumped into that wall for the last time. I've, I've witnessed. I've, I've been nice. I've loved. I've, I've forgiven. All right, from this point on, I'm calling my Aunt Nellie saved. I'm loosing you, Father. Go after her, good shepherd. Get her. <laughs> I'm calling her saved in Jesus' name, Father. I'm asking for laborers to come into the harvest, make it so Aunt Nellie can't go buy a pack of cigarettes at the quick trip without somebody telling her about Jesus. <laughs> you know, Lord, send angels at night like you sent to Norval's daughter that scared all the dope devils out of her, Lord. <laughs> Whatever it takes. But I'm starting to understand prayer if, if everything supernatural that happens is really the moving of the Holy Spirit, I mean, he's going to ask us to do stuff, but I'm telling you, his stuff, is, can I just say it? His stuff is more important than our stuff. Him moving is more important than me moving. And I don't even know what to do for Aunt Nellie, really, see? When we know not what to pray as we ought. I got, Lord, I don't know what to do anymore about Aunt Nellie. He may give you an idea. See, he gave me an idea that I would never, ever have thought of way back. It just so happened in our family, I got saved first. And, I mean, y'all look at Sue now. You think you wonder, She's so full of love and Jesus. Now you wonder if I'm saved. I know that. But, <laughs> but, but it didn't start out that way, okay? I, I just happened to get saved first, okay? And I was, you talk about it, I was, I was a totally unmortified person. I'm you know, I threw my Bible at her because she wouldn't go to church with me. I showed her the love of God, you know. <laughs> you know, you understand? I'm brand new. My fruit is so bitter, nobody wants it, okay? But, and I tried everything that I knew, and it wasn't working. And, but I, I did know a little bit about praying in tongues, and I just, I, many years before I met, past, knew about Pastor Dave, but Michael taught us a little bit about praying in, a, not Michael the Archangel, that's Michael Muccio. He taught us a little bit about praying in, so I was praying, and I got this idea just out of the blue, and I know now it was him. He said, buy her, now get this, this will date us a little bit, buy her the 8-track, <laughs> buy her the 8-track of the new album by Bob Dylan called Saved. And Sue didn't even like Bob Dylan, I can tell you, she was not a fan of Bob Dylan. And, but she loved, if you've ever heard the music on that particular album, it's not typical Bob Dylan. And it, all the words are good, they are, it is so scriptural. And it's good. It's the kind of music Sue likes. Got a lot of good piano in it and everything, you know. And I bought it for her, you know. Well, what an idea out of left field. Buy her this 8-track. Okay, that's something I can do. I put in that 8-track. Man, she loved it. She's dri now, we're in the real estate business, so she's in that car a lot where the 8-track is. She's driving around town, you know, looking at houses, doing different things, playing that 8-track all the time. Here's how, here's how the, the, some of the words of the first song goes. It's called Saved. Blinded by... Here's Sue, lost as she can be, driving around, singing along with Bob Dylan. <laughs> Blinded by the devil, born already ruined, stone cold, dead as I came out from the womb by his something. I've been blinded by his something. I'm saved by the blood of the lamb. I'm saved. She's calling herself saved. She's doing calling in the lost and doesn't even realize she's calling in herself. Now, that's a God idea. I would never, ever have thought of that. That's a God idea. Your Aunt Nellie is not smarter than God. Whoever that is, that, uh, yeah. I've got a grandson right now that I'm calling in, and I, he's not smarter than my God. Oh, Shandai Mahandai. How does Alan say it? Shaka, shaka, shaka. You know, glory to God. Makes you want to just go pray more? Because we've got this infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful Holy Spirit who is willing to pray the absolute answer for whatever it is we're facing if we'll just Lend him our authority and let him use our lips. Oh, my goodness. I still haven't finished. <laughs> Is this good or what? 
home. So these, this, this kind of thinking where I'm seeing if it, anything really gets done, it's the Holy Spirit that's getting it done. Okay? It's making prayer so much more of a, a weapon that we, than, than what I've realized in the past. Now, let's, let's look at this one. Go to 1 John 5. I want to look at verses 14 and 15. Because if we know His will, and we pray His will, and we do so in the authority of the name of Jesus, He will do the impossible. I'm going to add one more. He has to do it. You know why? Because He promised to do it. And He cannot lie. I stumble at what to say right there. Here's a God, a being, that cannot lie. And he comes and he says, oh, I, I see that you're, I'm going to be, I see that you're so stupid. <laughs> you don't know what my will is. You've been le- listening to limited men who have limited me, okay? Now, he would never call you stupid, okay? But limited men, you've been listening. Here's my word. And for those that can't see me, I'm holding out my Bible. You, at this, at so, many, so much of his will is already known. You just have to read it because that's what it means. Faith comes by hearing or reading. You've got to know what's in the word of God. His word is his will. His will is his word. Well, somewhere where you're reading in there, you're going to find out that the whole reason he hadn't already come yet, he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He's not willing that any perish. He's not wanting any to perish. He's wanting everybody to get saved. So you find that out. That's his will. That's your will and you can't lie. All right. First John chapter five then. Verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask. Does your Bible say anything? If we ask. Anything according to his will. If you know it's his will, you found it. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, he'll think about doing it for us. (laughs) No, no. If we know that he hears us, you found his will, you pray, you pray his will. And when you do that, you know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, boy, those next two words, we know. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Well, I already found out it's his will that my grandson not only be saved, but on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you know God saves millennials? (laughs) Filled with the Holy Ghost, because, boy, he can be a fire and an influence to all of his millennial friends. But even without that, God just wants him saved because he loves him. See? I found out his will. I can pray his will. And then we, that's why we, we pray. We offer him up to God. And then we just call him in. We say, Father, we're not, we know you heard us the first time. Father, we're thanking you. I thank you that my grandson is saved born again that he loves righteousness and hates evil my grandson has departed iniquity because he loves you Lord he loves you I thank you Lord that he's been baptized in the Holy Ghost speaks with other tongues that he spends hours at a time in your presence worshiping you and praying in the spirit and finding out your plan for his life Lord nothing in his life is more important than that but you could just go on for hours. You can just go on and on and on. Saying in English, every, you know, your own language, whatever you know to say, you can pray as well. But then you're going to come to the end pretty quick. I can pray for Mark and Lynn. I know a little bit about them. I know that God wants them saved and healthy and whole and prospered and those kind of things. But I run out of that in five minutes. But if I really want to make intercession for them, I say, I'm just going to give some authority let you just pray. I don't know for sure if he's praying for them because B might need prayer worse that day. (laughs) But I do know he'll be praying the perfect will of God. See? Hallelujah. Man, I'm I'm hyped up about calling in the lost again now. I'm telling you, if anything happens, it's him. What we got to do is things that release him to work. And boy, the words of your mouth are important. Anyway, 
Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? All right. I'm going to. This is new material that we didn't do this morning. Uh, go down. Go down. Go down. Go down. Go down. All right. Now, <clears throat> I know this. Don't get scared. Go to Genesis. <laughs> when we get to maps, I'll let you go. Here. Hallelujah. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. Now, at another place, it talks about he made his body from the dust of the earth, and he breathed the breath of life. Now, it's not oxygen. He breathed the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Amen? So the life that's in Adam came from the inside of God. It's such a picture of, of the light of life. Jesus, it, Adam had that light of life. Like Jesus was conceived with it in the womb of Mary. And like it's the same light of life that you received when you got born again. But let's go back to Adam for a minute. We don't really know what that world is like. You know, I wish there were some more chapters before they fell. <laughs> where we could really know, understand more about that world. I mean, we look at this world and it's beautiful. I mean, sunsets, aren't they great? And snow and different things. I mean... You know, I think this fallen world is beautiful, but I can't imagine. This is a fallen world. I can't imagine what it was like before Adam fell. Can't imagine really what, they, what their lives were like. But as great as it was, can we agree on one thing? Adam did not become God when God breathed into him. Adam had life. And he had eternal life. He would have lived forever if he hadn't sinned. Isn't that right? So he had life. But can we agree he was not God? Now, okay, now fasten your seatbelt here and hold your prophet rocks. That same life that Adam was conceived with, the same life that was breathed into Adam the day that God breathed into him, is the same life that was breathed into the womb of Mary. When she conceived the Lord Jesus. Now he is God. Made flesh. But he came to us. As a man. Now that's why he refers to himself. Son of, son of God. He also refers to himself. Son of man. He laid down his divinity. I'm not saying he didn't. He wasn't still God. I believe he was. This is a mystery. And I think about it too much. My brain goes, starts leaking out my left ear again. But. In the, to say it with, think about it like this. He is the last Adam. The first Adam was not God. The manifestation of Jesus was not God. What I mean is he didn't come to us as God. He came to us as a man. As he's got life in him. Just like the first Adam had life in him. Now this really starts explaining a lot. Oh, God damn, how do I say this now? Okay, I'm going to read my notes. Sometimes I write better. <laughs> now here's the, this, this, uh, this, this lesson here is called The New Nature is Not God. It, the New Nature is Not God. It is of God. It's, it, when I say the New Nature, the light of life, what if I said it that way? The life that was breathed into the first Adam. Right? Is the same life that was, if you'll allow me, breathed into you when you got born again. Got it? It's his nature. It's his life. But it's not him. You see what I'm saying? Now, Adam was not divine. I think we can all agree on that. All right? And when I get born again, how many of you know Gary's not divine? <laughs> okay. We're in agreement now, right? <laughs> I know we're in agreement now. Okay. I have the light of life, though. But see, if that's all that happens, if I just get born again, 
And, that, and I hate to even use that word, just get born. That is the miracle of miracles. I mean, Paul uses that example of trying to express God's great love and power. It's according to the power when he raised Christ from the dead. And that's the first new birth. Well, it's a miracle of miracles when we get born again from death to life. I don't want to minimize that. But at the same time, when that, when that happens, Adam was not divine. When I get born again, I am not divine. I do have the light of life. But at that moment, I am not the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between the life of God and God himself. If you want to know the truth of it, Dave belabored this point more than any other point on the Born Again Trail. It, those of us that were here, we kept going. I mean, you guys are getting the convinced. You know, you think there's a lot. 60 messages. Yes. Honey, <laughs> that's the condensed version. Okay? And he went week after week. And it was that, that verse that is so difficult. That spirit. In fact, I'll just read it to you. It's in Romans 8. He says, oh, hallelujah, let me back up here just a little bit. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him, see, not him, but the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Well, what raised up Jesus from the dead? Life was breathed into him. That life, he was dead. He was spiritually dead. He paid the price for us. But what See, it doesn't call him the first raised from the dead because he wasn't. Old people in the Old Testament was raised from the dead. Lazarus had already been raised from the dead. He's the first one born from spiritual death. What born to him? <laughs> Bad English. What birthed him? The light of life. What we call the new nature. It is the spirit which is of God. Now, the Holy Spirit's involved in that. It can't happen without the Holy Spirit. But it's not the Holy Spirit himself. It's the Spirit of God. They've belabored that again and again. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. That, so you received the light of life when you got born again. Well, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. But at this point, He's not talking about the Holy Ghost. He's talking about... In, the, in, in much the same way that before you got born again, you had a spirit of sin and death that animated you, caused you to be alive. Now you've got the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that animates you. Anyway, where I'm heading somewhere. <laughs> There's a, I'm, you're being super technical. That's okay. Dave, you remember, right? He labored over that verse and labored to make sure. We, because I'm telling you, 90% of the church world thinks it's talking about the Holy Ghost right there. And if you think that, you're going to have trouble. You know, it's going to cause you problems because it's not talking about that. All right, so let me stay with my notes here. <laughs> I'm going to start right at the beginning. Of my new nature is not God. It is of God. Adam was not divine. He had the, the life breathed into him. When I get born again, I have life breathed into me. That doesn't make me divine. It makes me alive. You got it? I have the light of life, but at that moment, I'm not the temple of the Holy Spirit when I get born again. I'm a, I'm a human with life. I'm much like the first Adam before the fall. Ah, ah I'm, I'm a child of God. You're, you're a child of God. You have his life in you, you know, and it's powerful. You don't have to sin anymore. Adam didn't have to sin. You do know that, right? He didn't have to. He chose willingly. That's what, anyway. All right. So at that moment, when you get born again, I'm a man born of God, having the light of life within me. I'm born of God in the same way that Jesus was conceived of God in the womb of Mary. And I'm talking about the man, not God in the flesh. I'm talking about the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. But Jesus was found in fashion as a man, a man born of God, having life, life within himself. Now we watch him for 30 years. Before he gets baptized in the Holy Ghost, he never does a miracle. He never raises the dead. He never opens a blind eye. This is one reason we don't study the Apocrypha, because some of those books say stuff like, like he, you know, he laid his hands on a little dead bird and the bird came back to life. No, he did not. Not before he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, he did not. 
No. What do we see? We see a man, a young man, a boy growing up who never had the sin. Isn't that something? What does that tell you? When you got born again, talking to all of us, when we got born again, right then we received the power to walk free from sin. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have smoked for 40 some odd years. <laughs> See, but I was raised with a different doctrine. I was raised with you're just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, there's no power there to stop sinning. There's just power to keep running back to the cross and running back to the cross. Thank God for the cross. But we're not supposed to have to run back to it every day because we're still sinning. But if I'd have known that like I know it now, man, I didn't have to keep sinning. Mm. So we watched Jesus for 30 years. He's got the li he's very much like the first Adam. He's got the life of God in him. He is a man born of God's spirit. He is free from sin. Now his body's tempted. His body's got the same kind of body that we have. It says he was tempted. I believe as a little boy he was tempted to lie, cheat, steal, <laughs> like all little kids at a certain. I've, I've and I'm seven, I'll be seventy three next month. I've asked a lot of parents, when did you teach your children to lie? None of now I've heard that gypsies actually do, but <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that's true or not. But I've no parents don't teach their children to lie, but one day they do. The first one comes, and you want to interrogate them. Who taught you how to do that? Who taught you what a lie is? How do you know what a no? It came by the nature that they're born with. It just come into maturity. Isn't that right? But when you get born again, you get a new nature that empowers you to live above sin. We watched Jesus do that for 30 years. But oh, the day came when he was first, he was baptized by John in the River Jordan. And we've talked about what that really is. For Jesus, that was a visual vow to the Father. Father, I know why you've sent me. See, Jesus was not repenting to have his sins washed away like everybody else was. He didn't have any sins to wash away. That's why John didn't understand when Jesus wanted to be baptized. He says, I, well, I need to, John's going, I need to be baptized by you. <laughs> you want to be baptized by me? But see, Jesus was being baptized for a different reason than all the other people. When he went down under the water, he's making a visual vow. He's not repenting. He didn't have anything to repent of. When he goes down under that water, he says, Father, I know why you sent me. I understand. I'm, I am the lamb to be slain. Father, this is my vow to you. I'm going all the way to the cross. I'm going to go all the way to death. But Father, when, they ra when John raises me up out of the water, that's also a demonstration of my faith in your word that says, you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will my flesh see corruption. Now to the Jewish mind, that means he's going to be raised before the fourth day. Remember when Lazarus, four days later, Jesus comes. By now he stinketh. Corruption had set in. Third day, God raised him from the dead. My feet. <laughs> if the rest of me was as young as my feet, I'd be running anyway. I get, my feet get excited, John. I don't know my feet get excited. They want to run off. But see, the day came. Now, when he made that vow, as far as heaven's concerned, when he went under that water... God, it's like a gavel came down in heaven. It is done. From heaven's point of view, even though he wouldn't physically go to the cross for maybe another three years, when he went down under that water, it's like a gavel came down in heaven. Adam is now dead. Because Jesus didn't die for himself. He died in the place of Adam. And I mean the whole species of Adam. It's like a gavel came down. The first Adam is dead. Only then is God free to reassign that dominion that we looked at a while ago. Only then is God free to reassign that dominion. If the first Adam is dead, hmm, whom would be a good candidate to be the last Adam? Ah, here's my son in whom I am well pleased. It was coronation day, if you'll allow me, for the last Adam. And he is to have dominion the same way the first Adam was to have dominion. That's why now with this new Adam on the scene, now we see the Holy Spirit coming to bring that dominion. 
Are you all getting anything out of this? Now, when the Holy Spirit comes in, now it, it's, a, it's a baptism. One of the reasons he had me do that lesson a week or two ago about six devils in a cup. You remember that? <laughs> time and space in the realm of the Spirit is different than time and space here. We can't be in two places at the same time. But in that realm, you obviously can, or else those devils are about four inches tall. Okay? <laughs> Which I don't think they were. Okay? So, when we get born again and we have that spirit of Christ, that light of life on the inside of us, somehow that makes a holy of holies. Even though we're not perfect, that place in us is. That new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. And somehow it is a, a dwelling place. We're God, the Holy Spirit. God. Now, up until this point, we said Jesus is not divine. And he really, <laughs> you, I, I know I'm going to get letters. <laughs> Even after he's filled with the Holy Ghost, he's still not divine as a man. Now, he is divine. I'm saying, because <laughs> later on he says, before Abraham was, I am. Don't get me wrong. But he is presenting himself to us as a man. So he can be the proto prototype that we can follow. See, well, up until now, he's had the power over sin, but we don't see him getting anybody else over the wall. We don't see any miraculous healings of leprosy or blind eyes open or legs growing out or anything. But boy, once the Holy Spirit, now God, God is in the house. God has come in. And we have a man, a, three dimension, a man wearing a three-dimensional body, but has a spiritual mind capable of understanding everything about God. And now he's filled with the Holy God, Ghost. Let me say it another way. He's filled with God himself. Wow. And now we see everywhere Jesus goes. He is the temple. He is, can I say it again? He's the temple of God with legs. He comes to impossible cases. That woman with the issue of blood that had been... You know, all those doctors. Let's take the other one. The woman that was bowed over. How many years was it? 18. Was it 18 years? A long time. And he just comes over. And he doesn't put her in planet fitness. <laughs> he doesn't put her. He doesn't change her diet. He doesn't, you know, any of the natural thing. And I'm not against, I, you know, I'm not against any of that. We're talking beyond that. And he speaks. Woman. Thou art loosed from thine infirmity. I, boy, I'd like to have been there. I, I wonder if it, the bones cracked <laughs> after being bent over, looking at your shoes for all those years, and then crack, pow, snap, <laughs> crackle, Rice Krispies. <laughs> and she stands up straight. What about the guy born blind? Over 40 years old, it says, born blind. Yet he comes away seeing. God's in the house. And he's trying to get that same mindset in us. Listen, none of us are divine. Have you figured that out yet? But we have the life of God. But when we got baptized in the Holy Ghost, we haven't really understood what that is. God has come in the house. And you have become a mobile temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's no longer isolated out there trying to do work in this realm. He's in this realm through you. Christ in you. And Jesus, the way he prayed it, he said, Father, I in them, and thou in me. Well, what does that mean? We did a lesson a couple of weeks ago. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. Did you get that? He proceeded from the Father. Now, Every time I think about that now, my praying in tongues. Now, wait a minute. I've got God the Father by his spirit on the inside of me. And he'll pray the Father's will through me to God the Father in heaven. <laughs> so the Father's hearing a Father-originated prayer. <laughs> he said, oh, that's my will. I'm going to do that. <laughs> think about that. He's praying his will from you to him. God's amazing. God's, God, God's just amazing. All right. So the Holy Spirit is God. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's when God comes on the inside of us. That's when God moves into the temple. 
He is literally the spirit of the father. Remember we went through that lesson meticulously. (laughs) See, it's impossible for the father to be in us without first Christ being in us. It's really what he was saying. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but by me. Well, that spirit of Christ is the spirit of life that we are born again with. Oh, my goodness. We could just go on and on with this. Can you see the meditations? When we get this, that everywhere we go, God goes with us. More than goes with us, he goes in us. We're going to become, and this is why I know, yes, part of the reason for going through this fire, what he's talking about, this wall of fire, is the purging of any handles. That's part of it. But at the same time, he is teaching that spiritual mind that's on the inside of your spirit because that mind has the capacity to know the things of God. Now, it's housed inside a three-dimensional brain that does not. But your mind is different than your physical brain. Amen? All right. You're going to wind up being smarter than Einstein? Yeah, you really are. One way, what had Jesus say? Wiser than Solomon is here. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm, if he's in you, guess what? We have access to so much. And again, I just, Pastor Dave's not here right now, but I just, thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for laying this out. How that we could on purpose, just because we want to, we can go as far into God as we want. But thank God, Pastor Dave taught us the tools on how to do it. I think we're headed to the best, most exciting year we've ever had. We're going to have fun like little kids with new toys. <laughs> Man, this is, we're going to be happy campers. I believe it. I got to quit. <laughs> I'm, I'm already running over. Hall- oh, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> like Alan said, we're terrible at the prayer center when it comes to holidays. You know, we're, we're more interested in this than we are the holidays. I, but I thank God for Christmas. Without him, we wouldn't have any reason for all of this. Glory to God. All right, well, let's go ahead and do, this is one of the things that we can do that Abraham learned to call those things which be not as though they were. That's one way that we can co-labor with the Holy Spirit because he works with words. So just repeat after me. Say, Father, I worship you. I glorify you. And I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. Therefore, I say, your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. And that'll be a miracle right there. We have that kind of worship (laughs) that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. We give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center... Those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, Discouraged, worn out, and tired. They won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged. 
strong and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Father, your glory fills every service. Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels filled with your glory, filled with your wisdom, filled with your love, filled with your grace, and anointed by your Spirit. They'll carry your presence with them And they'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare, we preach your gospel. The gospel of power. We'll never settle for a powerless gospel. We'll never settle for man's version of your gospel. Only yours. Because it's the gospel that saves the gospel that fills, and the gospel that heals. That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. And we'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service. And boy, these days are coming. I'm telling you. The lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. The dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth, intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back the forces of darkness over this region. They're opening up a window, a window of light, 25 miles in every direction, both horizontally and vertically. Oh, there is a fortress of angels surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now, softening the hearts where hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first words spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed, To the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit. 
the assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, all those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Now, I feel an exhortation right here. Those of you, I look around the room, I, most of you have been coming to the prayer more and more. Listen, when you already know from all the teachings that's been done, when you commit to prayer, and especially coming into the season prayer and fasting, you get a target on your back. Now, you know it's working when you start acting ugly. <laughs> But dross is starting to come to the top. And I'm saying that because Sue and I also, we're, you know, it's nothing unusual. Be on, be smart. Know what's going on. Recognize it because the whole point, he's trying to get you to not recognize it and, and get into strife and stuff. So we're, we're having to be double on guard. And Sue and I, we don't argue much anyway, but we're having to be double on guard. Say, oh, man. And part, it's devils, all right, but part of it is stuff in you. You've been praying to get the dross to come to the top. Well, bless God, it's coming. <laughs> then you got to deal with it. And that's not always easy, okay? But just don't be discouraged when that happens. Be, oh, I remember, I remember. This is this. I must be doing it right. I'm acting ugly. <laughs> anyway, you understand what I'm saying? All right. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're in authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The king has declared, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. The king has decreed, captives, you are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. <laughs> Father, you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it. But it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven... So in earth, as in heaven, so in Tulsa. Well, there are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There's no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is delivered, and there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is prospered, and Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free, every wheelchair emptied, all of them, no exceptions, every artificial help, wheelchairs, crutches, canes, Hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. They won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies. To the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time. All of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have. In the name of Jesus. 
Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing services in history. Fresh anointings, fresh giftings, like never before since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. So, my own soul, I command you, believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They will never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense I give no offense, and according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. Every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small. There are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. And whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free, free in spirit, free in soul, free in body, all are delivered, all are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet, because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack, and I declare an abundance. Abundance be in the name of Jesus. Therefore, we say there is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all and abound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. And we send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance mm. in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it. 
and it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. And I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself, and I love my neighbor as you have loved me. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, <laughs> that's what I do. I am your servant. And I am your bond slave. By my own free will choice. I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. And you'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. And where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30 fold, not just 60 fold, but 100 fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus, Father, thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory. Forever your will be done in Tulsa, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We have what we say. We have what we say. Tulsa is in revival. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. Now extend your faith. Maybe your hand towards this box. Father, again, we're not praying for these again tonight. Because you already told us that you heard us when we prayed the first time. Jesus said, if we believe we receive, when we pray, we shall have it. Father, we know you heard us. We shall see the miracle on each and every one of these impossible cases in Jesus' name. And Father, then for the prayer requests that are in this box, and we know new ones are added almost daily. Father, like we read tonight, if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And Father, if you hear us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of you. So we're just adding our faith to these and thanking you, Lord, for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. 
Father, if a stranger sent in a prayer request, someone who's not yet born again, they're not in the family, not in the kingdom, doesn't matter to us if they're agnostic, atheistic, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, or anything else. If they had enough faith to send a prayer request here, and if that request is in line with your will, your word, Father, we ask like Solomon asked, answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such a unique and unusual way. They will have to know it was you that answered that prayer. So they could know, like we already know, that you're the only true and living God. And they can hear the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of your son, and be saved. Father, we pray for every prayer cloth that goes forward from this place. Father, you haven't changed at all. You're the same God today that you were then in the book of Acts. And Father, that's why we expect the same results. When those claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on people that have devils, those devils will come out in Jesus' name. Alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. All manner of mental illness will be set free instantly. Marriages will be put back together. Wayward children will come to their senses and return to their parents' house. And Father, many other such things you do because you have not changed at all. And you're the same today that you were then. Father, it was so good to see Pastor Dave here today. We thank you for our pastor. We lift him and Rosalie up to you, Lord, in all of their house. We lift up Tim and Leah Stemple in all of their house. Father, all of the ministers and their families, not only here at the prayer center, but around the world, the congregations, the volunteers, the staff, Lord, we declare no weapon formed against any of them will prosper. But everything they set their hand to do will prosper. In the name of Jesus. And then, Father, last but not least, we're facing another week. It's a very busy week. It's to celebrate your birth. Lord, don't let us forget the reason for the season. It's not about gifts and it's not about food. It's about you, Lord. Thank God you were born. Thank God for God. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. But, Father, we do have... uh, A same number of hours really available to us as any president or any king. How we steward those hours make all the difference. Someday we're going to stand before you. Give an accounting of our stewardship. How we use the life that you gave us. Father when we do we sure want to have the same testimony as Paul. We fought the good fight. We kept the faith. And we finished the race that you set in front of us. Father, we thank you for all of these things. Father, for us, we know what that race is. It is revival. And we declare you will have your revival in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, you can say amen. Well, we've got about five minutes. Let me do at least a major part of praying for Dave here. Hallelujah. I know. There he is. Hello, Dave. Hallelujah. Dave blesses the Lord with all of his soul soul. and with all that is within him. Dave blesses the Lord and forgets not all his benefits. The Lord forgives all of Dave's iniquities and heals all of his diseases. Dave's life is redeemed from destruction. He is crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. Dave is satisfied with good things. And his youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord has lit Dave's candle. And enlightened his darkness. The Lord causes him to run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hmm. The Lord girds Dave with strength and makes his way perfect. The Lord makes him able to stand firmly and to make progress on the dangerous heights of testings and trials. This trial will one day be in Dave's rearview mirror. And it'll just be another testimony of what great things the Lord has done for Dave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
The Lord teaches Dave's hands to war. The Lord is his shield of salvation. The Lord's right hand holds Dave up. And his gentleness has made Dave great. The Lord causes Dave's feet to not slip. Dave has a sound mind full of love and power. Free from fear and torment. He is in constant fellowship with the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit. Who teaches him all truth. And shows him things to come. Dave has the mind of Christ. And he has access to all wisdom. That means Dave accurately discerns all things. And the Holy Spirit brings to his remembrance. All things which the Lord has spoken unto him. Dave is a steward of the mysteries of God. And he remembers every revelation he has received. Hallelujah. The Lord himself causes Dave's mind to articulate and hear clearly all the days of his life. The Lord himself causes Dave's health to be in place. And for his clothes and provision to always be more than enough. Dave takes authority over his mind. And speaks to his soul every day. And we join him, excuse me, and we join with him now saying, I command you to be sound and healthy. We, you are not permitted to lose memories. Never in Jesus' name. Dave continually walks in the peace of God. <laughs> Dave shall end up full of years and full of days. The nature of God comes forth in Dave as a reigning conqueror. It overtakes every dark part of the past and fills Dave with light. Dave follows the Spirit of God. And he shall end full of days and full of reward at the Lord's return. Dave is leading the charge into the revival. The revival of truth, soundness of mind, and sanity. A revival so grounded and sound that the finest minds will evaluate and say, Your God must be God. Lord, we magnify and glorify you. We rejoice in your presence. For you alone are freedom. You alone are our answer. Now let's praise him for a minute. Father, we do thank you and we praise you, Lord, especially here at this Christmas season. But Father, we're here to declare you found a people that believe that we receive when we pray. Father, we believe that when we speak to the mountain, that we believe that what we say shall come to pass. We refuse to doubt in our heart. Father, we believe every word spoken in these services shall come to pass exactly as they have been spoken. Because you said it, we have what we say. In Jesus' name. Amen.